All right. Um, welcome, everybody. Um, welcome to the this afternoon's lecture as part of the fall 2021 series organized by the School of Architecture in the College of Architecture, Planning and Landscape Architecture at the University of Arizona. So I'm gonna be trying to admit people and read the announcements at the same time. So bear with me if I um, am looking a bit distracted here. Um, I, I can I, help now. Okay, brilliant. <laughs> then we can switch roles afterwards. Um, so my name is Beth Weinstein. I'm an associate professor in the School of Architecture and I chair the School of Architecture's events committee and um, in that endeavor, along with Bob Perkins, Oscar Lopez, Teresa Rosano, and two students, uh, Alfredo Quezada and Hallie Letzinger. Uh, we respectfully acknowledge that the University of Arizona is on the lands and territories of indigenous peoples. And today, Arizona is home to 22 federally recognized tribes, with Tucson being the home to the Odom and uh, Yaqui. Committed to diversity and inclusion, the university strives to build sustainable relationships with sovereign native nations and indigenous communities. And so on behalf of Kapla community, I pay my respects to these communities and their elders past and present. We're pleased to gather creative and critical thinkers and makers in the built environment from nearby, right here, and places far away to share their ideas and work with our students, faculty, staff, alumni, and friends, wherever they may be. Before I introduce today's speaker, I would like to inform you about the next events we are hosting on Wednesday, October 27th. Alan Ricks, the founding principal of Mass Design Group, will lecture on justice as beauty. On November 3rd, the School of Landscape Architecture and Planning hosts affiliate faculty member Jonathan J. Unchrisman, who will be speaking about civic expression, art, culture, and the built environment in Little Tokyo. And on Monday, November 9th, uh, sorry, Monday, November 8th, please join us for the 2021 stall lecture by Becerra Pancheva, who's a professor of art and art history at Stanford University. Her talk titled Eternal Victory, the Hagia Sophia and the Byzantine Vision of Empire is funded by the International Center for Medieval Art and is co-sponsored by the Department of Civil and Architectural Engineering and Mechanics, AME, Department of History, the Fred Fox School of Music, the School of Art, UA Medieval Renaissance and Reformation Community, and Kapla. Her lecture will be the first of two that she'll be giving uh, in, universe, in, in Arizona, and the second, hosted by ASU, will occur on November 12th. You can find more information about all of these upcoming events, their speakers, times and links to register at kapla.arizona.edu under the news and events menu. So I'm now pleased to introduce our speaker for this evening, Kirk Diamond. Kirk is an assistant professor of landscape architecture here at the University of Arizona. Though initially interested in architecture, his lineage of two generations of excavators and chance exposure to landscape architecture spoke to his love for natural systems and patterns and landed him in the Bachelor of Architecture, sorry, Bachelor of Landscape Architecture program at Utah State University. As a student, he became a lead AP early on and attributes his study for the test in shaping an interdisciplinary perspective and desire to work with architects and engineers. His professional experience led him to helping to initiate a landscape architecture and planning branch at an architecture firm in Salt Lake City, Utah, where he fulfilled his desire to work closely with peer professionals. He later took on a faculty position with advising duties along the BR. Uh, among the BARC program at Penn State University and considers himself a friend no. of the profession. Well, 
uh, a friend of the of the profession playing well and having an appreciation for the skills and insights of an architectural perspective. Here he teaches the technical sequence in site engineering, grading and drainage, and landscape construction, along with design studios focused on process. He's also grateful for the engagement with his architectural colleagues and with much joy in joining in for reviews and lectures across disciplines. His colleague, Margaret Livingston, writes, and I quote, I consider Kirk a consummate colleague and teacher in the School of Landscape Architecture and Planning. Much of his research focuses on landscape performance, and we have collaborated on a few projects that focus on evaluating microclimates in a variety of site conditions. Currently, we are measuring performance of native plant species richness in varying microsites on a campus green roof. I always find Kirk to be generous with his time and availability for discussions, whether it is with me or other faculty members and students. His work has led to several presentations and articles, and most importantly, in my opinion, he focuses on bringing his research work into the classroom and illustrating its significance in design applications, end quote. So as mentioned in Professor Livingston's reflections, Kirk Diamond's research involves landscape, uh, involves landscape performance by evaluating social and ecological synergies and trade-offs in design decisions related to ecology, energy, and water. Kirk is currently working on the integration of solar PV infrastructure into the urban landscape through design strategies and exploration of social and environmental co-location opportunities. So we are looking forward to learning more from Professor Diamond about the photovoltaic green roof. So please welcome this evening's speaker, Kirk Diamond, and it's over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Beth. Uh, nice introduction. And, and thanks to Margaret if she, she watches this later on. She couldn't be here tonight. Thank you all for, for spending a Friday afternoon, late afternoon, evening with me. Um, hopefully, uh, we can engage in some nice conversations. I, I like seeing a, a few uh, familiar names. Not so much faces, but names, <laughs> and uh, and so yeah, I, I look forward to engaging with you uh, after the the presentation. So let me share my screen here. Everyone see that all right? Yes. All right. Okay. Well, so going out on a little bit of a limb here uh, at the very beginning and. Uh, to be honest, I anticipated uh, more architecture students. There might be a few of you, I'm, I'm not sure, but uh, uh, one thing I want to declare early on is that I know that architects like green on their buildings, but to be honest, it's not that efficient. It's not that sustainable, and especially in the Sonoran Desert. Um, and so, um, you know, I just wanted to get that out of the way first. I know this talk is about green roofs, but uh, there you have it. Now I'll back up for a second. And I, I will admit that I am a fan of green roofs. And so the process that I'm going to go through here, looks like it skipped a few slides. First, I'm gonna talk about the trade-offs, why we shouldn't do green roofs, and then contextualize that a little bit more with the next slide, looks like my, Slides are lagging for some reason. Come on, come on. There we go, synergies. Okay, so how can a green roof be justified? So looking at performance, um, you know, with anything uh, green, sustainable, there's gonna be synergies and trade-offs. And so how can we tip the scale in favor of those synergies? Um, and then I have what I'm presuming a lot of you came for is the what's happening on the ENR2 PV green roof, uh, kind of an exciting project. And I will get fairly deep into that and hopefully be able to answer most of your questions. And if not, you know, definitely have those conversations outside of the time tonight. So starting with why not a green roof? You know, really it... A big part of it has to do with our evapotranspiration, um, our ET. And, uh, you know, down here, I was just looking at a few numbers. And up in Scottsdale, you'll see why I chose Scottsdale in a moment. 
uh, our evapotranspiration rate in June, July, and often August, probably depending on how much monsoon we get, is around close to 10 inches um, throughout that month. And now some of you may be familiar with this project, Be beautifully done. I, I, it's really fun. I haven't been there personally yet, but I do intend to go and check it out. And I read about it a bit, and you know, some of you may know better than me that uh, I understand it was designed by architects from Chicago, where the ET rate is much lower than, than here, and, and kind of peak is isolated to one month rather than three months. And uh, my understanding is that the landscape architects were given this project with four inches of soil specified. And, uh, you know, you can imagine four inches of soil with a almost 10 inch evapotranspiration rate. And a lot of water has to go into this, regardless of whether the plants are drought tolerant or not. And they, you know, they, they did some good research on this and, and try to be as responsible as they could in that sense. But uh, four inches of soil is, is a hard sell for, for Arizona. Okay, um, you know, another reason is, uh, you know, why not cool roofs? Um, you know, there's been a lot of studies done about this. And uh, just to pull from a few that I'm familiar with, this uh, diagram shows the performance of cool roofs do, um, uh, do help out with the cooling more consistently and more generally than, than green roofs. Green roofs do have a broader variety of, of performance metrics. Um, that have been taken, but, uh, uh, you know, it is a pretty efficient system and low cost. So this is another su uh, study that showed, you know, tipping kind of the triple bottom line in favor of economics when comparing a green roof, a solar roof, and a reflective roof, reflective winds, right? It's, it's uh, a more basic system and, and doesn't involve the, the upfront costs that uh, green roof and solar roofs do. The other thing is, you know, green roofs are heavy, you know, the buildings need to be reinforced enough to support that. And, uh, and so that's a, an added cost that potentially goes into it. Um, you know, there's exceptions to that where uh, the buildings are existing and already do have uh, enough structural integrity to, to support a system. But generally in Arizona too, you know, we're we're not dealing with snow loads like um, more temperate climates. And, and so the buildings, you know, haven't had to be reinforced as much as those that uh, take those snow loads. And so there again, you know, especially existing projects, it, it might not even fit to, especially if you're going for more than four inches of, of soil. You know, there's arguments that oh, green roofs help with with insulation, and you know that is true to an extent. A lot of that comes from the soil layer, um, but in rea reality, conventional roofs, cool roofs, uh, the insulation nowadays is pretty efficient. And if I'm not mistaken, I think since the '90s, buildings have been pretty good about getting insulation in the the roof. And uh, even with a green roof, you can see this layering. This this uh, layer here actually represents insulation anyway. Uh, maybe there's less of it, but so you could argue, oh, well, maybe there's there's less insulation. Styrofoam isn't great as great for the environment either, but it's it's there in the system as well, regardless. And, and then there's other synthetic products in that go into green roofs. So kind of trade-offs there. Um, and then the third reason is the comparison to the ground plane. And so this is the one I want to hit on the most, you know, from a landscape architecture perspective, you know, green roofs have a myriad of benefits. Um, you know, so this is that same study we saw before they tipped the scale in favor of environmental or social um, factors, benefits. And so in both cases, the green roofs win. Um, However, uh, you know, some of these things can be achieved and better achieved on the ground surface. It looks like my slide stuck again. Give me a moment here. But um, 
I'll just keep talking. So, you know, some of those benefits are habitat, uh, stormwater management, aesthetics, the biophilia effect, you know, the mental health, seeing living things, uh, cooling, roof material life. Um, but how much is being done at the ground plane? Come on, come on. Um, so just from a cost perspective, the, um, you know, the, the labor it takes to transport material onto a roof versus the ground is, is gonna be factored in. The specialized blends of soil, um, even plant material, uh, you know, it, it, it's an added expense compared to the ground. And with my other slides, I can show you kind of comparisons, but I actually uh, intended to get a, a good cost comparison, but there's so much vari variability out there that um, there's, there's not a clear cut, you know, green roofs are four times as expensive to install. That's that's probably true in a lot of cases, but in other cases, it could be 10 times. Um, you know, some ground level projects are going to be more expensive as well, but uh, there's just a lot more input into green roofs. The other thing is um, carbon, you know, life, uh, the, the life cycle, uh, cradle to grave uh, considerations. The, materials on a green roof, the efforts to ship it in and install it, just uh, everything that goes into it does cost per square foot more than it would on the ground plane. Um, the other thing is more of like a, a social issue in the sense that, you know, if you think of the biophilic effect, green roofs aren't going to be as accessible, generally speaking, as the ground plane right, to, to general public or to users in general. And, um, and so that's something that we need to take into consideration as, as a perform, performance metric as well. I mean, not to say that we have to have all our, our landscapes available to everyone. Uh, that's obviously not the case, but uh, how, how much worth, how much value is it providing per person or, um, you know, thinking in, the, in those terms. Okay, let's see where I'm at with my slides now that they released a little bit further. Okay, so I was just going to show you. So this is an example of cost. This is a green roof in California where, you know, it looks great. It's, it's performing and, and uh, it's there. But what we don't really perceive is that it was actually... Uh, it failed the first time, got totally torn out, and was reinstalled. Uh, so huge expense there. It's won a lot of awards, regardless. But uh, you know, kind of the, the part of the story we don't hear so much. And then here's just a little diagram showing, you know, our our Underwood Garden at Capla. You know, could we have say four of those compared to one green roof? Um, you know, again, it's hard to say, but. Just something to think about there. Oh no, what is happening to my slides? Mind if I pause and stop I, sharing real quick? I, I think stop sharing and resharing would be very okay. well. <laughs> Thank you, sorry. I tested it out before and it was working, but I can't even find them. Give me just a moment here. Maybe what I'll do is just switch to read mode if that's okay with everyone. It's not a full screen, but. No, I just need to find my screen again. 
Okay. Hopefully that progresses better now. <laughs> Sorry about that. Okay. <clears throat> um, so yeah, so this this is just a uh, an article that I wrote a couple of years ago that uh, one of the interesting findings of this so it, it compared uh, you know sele site selection for a green roof versus putting solar panels on a roof and um, you know more of a literature review looking into a lot of different studies and one of the things that really emerged is context is everything what's available on the ground plane so in a higher density urban environment with less opportunities on the ground plane you know a green roof is going to provide that much more value whereas in a, a more suburban or rural area there's really not that much greater value of having that green roof because you can do so much on the ground plane there's there's more space not that we always do that but uh but you know the bang for your buck you know doing it at the ground plane is cheaper and and more effective in that sense and then even in an urban environment thinking about green walls so so I, I am not a fan of green walls in the exterior environment. I've, I've seen a lot, even in Pennsylvania, my time there, they did some research on green walls. And in that MESIC environment, it was still just wasn't wet enough to, to really sustain it with the, the way that the root structure works and watering, you know, the physics of that. Um, but this is an example that I found really fascinating. This is uh, Architectural Nexus in Sacramento. Um, that's a firm I, I used to work for in their Salt Lake City office, and uh, and so I, I I was tuned into this project. They did a the Living Building Challenge, and it turned out that their their water budget was excessive. They had too much water on site and and not enough landscape because it was a more urban site, and uh, this was their solution to to solve that problem is introduce a green roof or a green wall that inside their lobby that allowed for that water to be used. It did take a little more energy with the lighting, but they had room in their energy budget uh, to, to be able to do that. So, you know, every, all these systems taking place on, on site, they did not do a, a green roof in, in that environment. And I, I think that was the right choice. This, you know, the, the lobby is a more controlled environment from the get go. And so this becomes more achievable. So this is the, the main green wall that I've, I've appreciated. I, I think the, the design uh, behind that, the performance, uh, you know, justifies that existence. So a lot, a lot of places to explore first before going up onto, onto the roof. But how about those synergies then? Uh, so how can we justify a green roof? And I, like I said, I, I love green roofs. Um, yeah, I, I do hope we can have more of them, but in a, in a responsible way. So this is a project I, I worked on with Architectural Nexus. Um, this is at the Can Can Huntsman Cancer Center in Salt Lake City uh, on the University of Utah campus. And, you know, behind these windows here is patient, patient rooms. Um, and so in that sense, the biophilic performance, if it's helping with healing, if it's helping with, um, you know, comfort and even uh, uh, the slightest of ways, you know, I, I think we can justify it, right? I, you know, it's hard to argue against a, a situation like that, the context like that. And, you know, thinking about the, the design of the space, if this were a cool roof, you know, you'd get a lot of glare, you know, bouncing off that reflective surface into the windows and making it more uncomfortable. And so, you know, that uh, that performance comparison, you know, there there's the trade-offs, and and I think in this case, the the green roof um, is a little more justified. Now. Um, now it's not a perfect solution. Uh, we use drought tolerant plant material, uh, but it's still irrigated. Um, however, compared to down here, it's it's less of the year. You know, it wouldn't be irrigated in the winter time, and uh, and then Salt Lake City is less arid than here. The evapotranspiration rates would be lower. Um, I didn't intend to get those numbers, but didn't. But I'm I am certain it's lower. I think it's in peak time of the year, it might be eight inches 
um, but that's mainly just July. I, I don't think June and August are quite as extreme as, as we, we see from the Scottsdale example. Now this one's kind of an interesting one. So this is on Penn State campus. I wasn't in, involved in the design of this, but I did get kind of privileged access to it at one point. My, I had a friend who was the VP for technology at the, the law school. This is the law building on Penn State's main campus. And um, he got keys from his dean and, and took me up there one time. And I, I actually saw in bloom, it was the sedums. We had perfect lighting. It was just gorgeous. Uh, he took some nice photographs and shared them with me on, on uh, Google Drive. And I never downloaded them and, and lost access to them and haven't been able to get in touch since. So, so you've got kind of this ugly picture of it. But <laughs> um, this one, you know, being in the context of Pennsylvania, uh, definitely helps it out a lot. Uh, a mesic environment, I, I think it is a thin layer of soil. Um, I, I want to say four inches, it might even be three, to be honest, but uh, it it's mostly sedum, so it's real low ground cover. Um, you know, the sedum is drought tolerant, and, and there are times of drought in Pennsylvania too, and uh, it can tolerate that without irrigation, so no no water use on this. Flooding is a, an issue and so forth. Um, however, on this one, you know, I, I think you, you can see by the image, there's plenty of landscape around to, to do a lot of the services and they didn't maximize that on this project. Um, and so it was more of a showcase. They had the budget for it. It's the law school, you know, that kind of thing. So I don't know if this is fully justified, but given the context, you know, it, it's more achievable and um, I wish it was more accessible to students and, and uh, you know, other, other people being able to get up there, but really you can only see it um, with special access if you know somebody, or if you're in a balloon or, or blimp or something, it's not too far from the stadium. Um, so yeah, it is what it is, but uh, it has some advantages but there could definitely be more. So when I came to Arizona, I wasn't even thinking about green roofs here. And uh, one thing I did notice though, is a lot of solar panels going up. And I got here around the time when all the, the school districts were starting to put uh, these shade canopies in their schoolyards. And, you know, interesting thing that kind of uh, emerges is if you can see in this, bad photo, sorry about the, the, the bad photo, but you can see the, the green underneath compared to the yellow in the exposed sun. So obviously something's going on there. There's a microclimate that's uh, giving an advantage to, to the plant material underneath. And, um, and so that started to interest me. I uh, started to think about what, what I could do, you know, research-wise along these lines. And I ran across this that you may be familiar with at Biosphere 2, uh, Greg Baron Gafford um, had initiated this, this project, uh, putting agriculture, you know, food crops underneath uh, solar canopies and, and actually has a few set up in town with uh, different schools. And I read his article and, uh, you know, about this work and, uh, reached out to him and said, hey, you know, that's, that's the kind of stuff I want to do. I actually, my, my master's thesis was on uh, community gardens. And so this, this was really appealing in that sense. And uh, he said, yeah, we, I've been meaning to reach out to your school and see if I could find someone to work with me. And so we, we teamed up and, and, uh, and he, he's doing a lot of neat stuff out there. We, we've got an article. This is from the article in uh, Nature Sustainability. And just showing the relationship between uh, the plant materials and the solar panels that there's there's this co-benefit happening and so it's not just the the shade um, cast onto the plants that uh, is helping out the plants but uh, the the evapotranspiration that is occurring can help cool the solar panels during peak times <clears throat> and uh, and so we can we can start to measure some of those benefits. And he's, he's done a lot with that and, and really inspired 
what I'm going to go into with the ENR2 project. So, um, and he actually pulled me into it. He, he works in ENR2 and, and uh, invited me over for these discussions and, and so forth. So I'm, I'm grateful for uh, hooking up with him and, and all he's been able to achieve. Um, so yeah, so with the ENR2 uh, building, you know, going, going for a green roof there, you know, it adds this layer of co-location that, you know, perhaps between these two systems, we can further synergize, you know, beyond, you know, what I, what I just shared with you there. Um, but before I get too far into that, I did want to uh, just do a little clarification here. So this is a, an email I, I received a, a couple of days ago announcing this lecture tonight. And um, it says here, Kirk Diamond shares his experience designing and installing a photovoltaic green roof on the award-winning UNR2 building. Just to clarify, I did not design and install it. Um, uh, so I'm sharing my perspective on the designing and installing of this green roof. Uh, many others were involved in the, the design, GLHN, architects and engineers. Joyce Kelly was great working with her. Um, you know, so I was kind of a, a faculty consultant, I guess you could say in some ways, along with Greg and, and uh, uh, we brought, brought in Margaret Livingston as well. Um, and so the, the three of us, you know, received information from, from the design team and, and were able to share our perspectives and some ideas. And, and so a lot of people involved can't take any credit for the design and installation of, of the, the project. But um, as I have listed here, the research team, we did pursue a uh, seed grant through CAPLA, uh, the College of Architecture Planning and Landscape Architecture and uh, received funding to support Keegan Thomas, our graduate assistant, uh, who is doing many of the observations. And it's really just kicking us off. It is a seed grant. We're looking at establishment of the screen roof and we have big plans beyond it. And I'll, I'll share some of that. So just a, a little overview with ENR2. Um, I'm assuming most of you are familiar with this building, but just in case, um, it was completed in 2015. It's received a lot of acclaim for the architecture and the integration of plant material in the, this slot canyon. Um, there are pockets of plant material on each of these layers. Um, so in, in, you know, by some definitions, you can call that a green roof. Um, there are challenges to that with the shading. It, it does make it so it's not so exposed as the roof, um, but uh, you know, it is a very interesting building, great uh, piece of architecture here on campus. Now, this is a view of the roof. Um, if you are familiar with ENR2, chances are you might not have spent much time on the roof, but maybe you have. Uh, there's a little conference room up here. Um, there's a lot of events happening there, so it is well used. I guess COVID kind of slowed that, that down a bit, but, you know, people are getting up onto the roof and then also enjoying this patio. Um, so my understanding, and I, I don't have all the details, but my understanding is that these four areas were initially um, earmarked to be a green roof with the, the initial construction, but I'm assuming it was an ad alternate part of the plan and budget didn't allow for it at that time. They still carved out the spaces for that, um, but it didn't happen. Uh, regardless, it is accessible. There's a restroom up there, stairs, elevator, uh, even going through the conference room, you can, you can get there. And actually, the, this entrance here is open uh, to people generally um, during business hours. And so uh, I've, I've seen a lot of students up there enjoying the roof and so forth. So I, I think it's good that it's accessible in that sense, but it is six stories up. So my understanding is that with those kind of voids that were left uh, with the planned green roof area, uh, it was a bit of a hazard and there might've been somebody that fell into one, but uh, that prompted a, a um, push to get the screen roof in, uh, installed in there. And then um, kind of coinciding with 
the university's 100% clean energy agreement with TEP, um, the idea of agrivoltaics, for, for lack of another term, came forward. And uh, this was the initial plan from GLHN. So large array on the north side, um, covering those, those four pockets to, to some degree. And then even on the south side, there, there was intent to um, have solar panels installed and do more agrivoltaics over here uh, with actual um, uh, ed edible crops. Uh, the idea was up here, there, there wouldn't be edible crops. But you can still consider it agrivoltaics because we, we did pursue pollinators. So supporting agriculture in that sense, it, it still is classified as agrivoltaics. So yeah, so uh, the, what ended up being the, the route that the university went is to put green roofs in just these two areas. Um, and then uh, you can see the solar array covers a portion of that. I want to point, point out just an interesting little tidbit. You'll have to go and see if you can tell, but these 12 panels at this top corner uh, are fakes. They, I, I'm guessing it has to do with the sizing of the inverter and everything, but uh, um, yeah, there's some fake solar panels on our solar array there. That might be interesting to, to see how that performs to heat wise and, and so forth. But anyway, this is a, a nice photo of Kevin Choi. Uh, he's a student in, in the BARC program and uh, is employed by the uh, Center for Sustainability. He took some really nice photos out there. So I have a few of those in here. Um, you can see the, the conference room here. So it does relate directly to that uh, being visible from, from the conference room. And that, it, it's a pretty big deal, that conference room, and beautiful up there. Um, I've been in a meeting where we posted delegates from uh, Ecuador, you know, so international uh, visitors coming and, uh, you know, among many others uh, around campus and everything. So really a special area. I've heard of a lot of others having events on, on the patio and so forth. So it's there's, there's that goal for, um, you know, aesthetics and, and representation and, and so forth mixed into this research project as well. Here's another view for you. So overall, um, there's about 4,800 square feet of planting area. Um, I mentioned the 12 fake solar panels, but there are 263 real ones. Um, I'm not sure how many kilowatts that is, uh, but something probably around 70, 75 or so. I, I need to confirm that. Um, we actually just seeded a few weeks ago, and, uh, and so it's not fully established yet. And it's, it's funny, um, you know, I was supposed to originally give this lecture, I think it was last spring, but uh, with COVID, the project kept getting pushed back a little bit further. It was it was in motion before COVID hit, and then the university, um, you know, they, they halted all new projects for a time, and it got misclassified as a new project when in reality it should have continued. And so that got us hung up just for a little bit. They got it corrected and then started to be able to proceed. But uh, yeah, with getting equipment for for sensing and everything, it, it just pushed back further and further and further. And, and finally, just about uh, nine weeks ago, actually, is when we finally got seed up there. And it was a mixture of all these plants, 34 species. Um, these are native, you know, drought tolerant. Uh, they're, they're pollinators and, and actually are kind of mid-story mid perennials in the sense that, uh, you know, we're, we're trying to create some structure up there. Uh, Margaret was influential in, in crafting the, the, the list here. And, um, and one thing, you know, she pushed for that I appreciate is we've got some acacias here that, you know, do get, I mean, they, they're small trees, to be honest, that, uh, um, you know, in that 
thin layer of soil. I mean, in their native habitats, they're, they're often in, in thin stratas of soil. And so it, it'll be interesting to see how they perform and, and uh, how that all works out. So it's, it's an experiment. Uh, and so we're excited to see how things come up and, and that's what we're monitoring initially here. So <clears throat> initial plans, you know, again, supported by, by CAPLA with the seed grant, um, we had planned out to have five replicates of, of four different conditions. Um, and so these are plots laid out that uh, we were trying to capture different depths. So there's eight inch depths and five inch depths. And then we have those in the shade and those in the sun. And, um, and so trying to um, do comparisons between those different conditions, we had to suggest a few changes. And I'll, I'll actually talk about that a little more later. But, uh, but yeah, this was kind of our initial plan to look at two different depths and those two different conditions, shaded and not shaded. Um, this is a, a beautiful rendering of, of what it could look like, but I want to be clear, this is not what it's going to look like. Um, you know, many of these are succulent and cacti plants that uh, the evapotranspiration, the, the transpiration isn't occurring that much among um, succulents. And, and so with the co-benefits, we really wanted to make sure we, we went in a way that, um, you know, would have a, a, a big variety for one, but um, plants that would be transpiring, um, bringing a, a benefit to the panels. And so I um, just wanted to point that out there. But, you know, our, our thought is it would be kind of a nurse tree type of situation, uh, at least initially, where uh, there's that microclimate being protected by the solar panels overhead. And, uh, and so that's why we're interested in the establishment period beyond that. I think we'll see more evidence of the plants benefiting the solar panels, but you'll see I, I am kind of emphasizing the solar panels benefiting the, the plants, you know, with this discussion uh, right now. But to, to kind of frame it a little further, I, I'm a fan of constraints uh, to an extent. Uh, I think constraints are very interesting, uh, bring a lot about, bring about a lot of creative ideas and so forth. And, and so I just wanted to frame this with design constraints and research constraints, um, how things have, have kind of panned out. So from a design perspective, GLHN did, did their homework, which is wonderful. <laughs> um, they found that they couldn't just allow for the entire void that, that was existing there next to the patio to be filled in with, with soil. There's weight limitations. Um, there's a, a cantilevered portion that as you get closer to the edge, you know, physics, it's kind of that lever. It's, uh, it's, uh, if it's too heavy, it's, it's going to put a risk to the building. And then as you get closer to the columns, then you can allow for greater depths. And so that's what prompted the idea to look at those two different depths. We actually were allowed to use three different depths. You can see 12 inch depth near the column. There's a radius that goes around the column that would allow for that. We actually opted into just maintaining everything at eight inch depth so that you know, we could fit our plots in there to get those two different conditions. This says four inch soil, but later on it was actually changed to five inch and uh, we were able to achieve that with a, a lightweight soil. And so this is kind of showing how that's being installed. There's the, the system here. It could be de deeper around the column, um, but we've, we filled in with geofoam to, to get to those more shallow depths or appropriate depths. And then as you get closer to the cantilever, you would see this step up a little bit. So that's a more shallow soil profile. The other thing you can see over here is that uh, we had to use a crane to get the soil up onto the roof. And, and so that was pretty fun to watch, pretty interesting uh, you know, technique. But again, speaking to that idea that 
it's easier, a little cheaper on the ground level. You know, we don't need cranes typically to move soil into a, a site. Um, so yeah, so there was a little bit of back and forth between kind of our, our research team and the design team for the, the roof. And they were really great about uh, procuring our, our input. And so what I'm showing here is a plan I prepared to, to give them that helped us uh, lay out our, our, um, our plots in a way that we could get all the way around them, a little bit of spacing for, for people to stand in between. Um, but given the conditions, uh, you know, we had to extend the area for the four inch a little bit further. And then this kind of shows, you know, these are the, the 12 inch depth areas. We just went ahead and kept that all eight inch. That didn't fully get translated to the construction team. I'm not sure what happened there. And so it did um, get built where there is a more limited amount of uh, I think I said four inch earlier, but I meant five inch. This is a five inch depth. And so our plot layout as shown here couldn't work out, especially on this right hand side. Um, the, the deeper portions did get changed to eight inch though. So that, that worked out. You know, and I, I mentioned the constraints with, um, well, I mean, you can think of it as an opportunity or constraint, but uh, you know, the, the dual, goals of you know doing research having kind of this messy ecosystem type of thing but then also having the conference uh, room along with the patio right there for social engagement and so forth and so we were very careful to um, you know create our our plot frames to have a little bit higher aesthetic you know you can see here on the left there most of the time these these quadrat um, frames are made out of PVC pipe and just kind of glued together and taken out into the field. Um, we spent some time to design out these aluminum frames uh, with a little bit higher aesthetic and then uh, facilities and maintenance uh, built it and we put them up there and, and um, if you look here, we tried to be careful to, you know, follow existing lines and you know think about design and the layout uh, there's pretty accurate spacing to be consistent across each one and so forth and um and so we, we tried to be sensitive to that and then you know these pollinators they're not looking so great just yet but uh, they'll, they'll put on a good flower show in the in the future and so there is an aesthetic to this um However, my latest discovery last time I was up there found that they ended up putting chains up there, yellow plastic. So um, if anyone out there wants to donate to upgrade those chains, you know, let's talk. <laughs> but uh, not not the highest aesthetics right there. But um, you know, I I I think I would have preferred to keep it open to as part of kind of the social experiment of of the roof. I have seen students walk across there as kind of a, a, a shortcut to, to get to the, the stairs. That was before it was seated, but um, you know, it'd be interesting to see behavior, see how much um, people do interfere in that sense. And, but hopefully our, our plots would you know, be a clear enough designator, but uh, they went ahead and put the chains up and and I'm hoping we can at least like spray paint them or something, uh, get something a little more aesthetic in there. Irrigation is the other challenge. Um, you know, roofs, green roofs have a lot of wind and, uh, and so spray irrigation isn't always real efficient in that sense. Um, because there's a lot of misting and, and overspray and, and so forth. So rightfully, you know, they put uh, drip irrigation up there. And um, this is just kind of showing how it works, that the tube would come up just below the surface. And, uh, and then every, I think it's every 12 inches on, on our system, um, it would output, you know, like one, one or two gallons per hour of, of water. 
and um, that's fine and all, except that the soil on green roofs is pretty porous. You know, we don't want to be retaining too much because that adds to the 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 weight of it. But um, you know, so so when we're seeding, we do want that water to make its way up enough to kind of benefit the seeds. The seeds are just raked in kind of to that, so that surface layer. Um, fortunately, we were helped with the monsoon, um, but I, you know, I'm, I'm thinking we may need to find a way to get kind of a spray on top to uh, help those seeds eventually. Uh, we'll, we'll see what the winter rains bring us as well. Um, and, you know, different seeds will sprout at different times as well, depending on the temperature and all. But um, it, it's, it's kind of an experiment in that sense. Um, and you'll, you'll see more of, of what I'm getting at with regard to that. So as I mentioned, our, our plots didn't work out quite how we wanted with the depths so we can test the the two conditions exactly the other thing was the irrigation we were able to get uh four four valves for four different zones and the initial design um was just straightforward the, the, just these, these angled um runs of of the the drip tubing but uh, we had suggested that that be changed to something more like this, and this would follow the boundaries of those depths. And, uh, and so we can control, you know, run the, the valves less time for the five inch, um, you know, at a time anyway, and a little bit longer for the eight inch just to allow for that percolation and, and uh, distribution of the water. Um, and anticipating that the five inch would need to be watered more frequently, you know, we could uh, distinguish it from the eight inch. You know, the other way we could have done it is sun versus shade. I think for research purposes, though, we'd keep it as a constant and and uh, and run them consistently at the same time. But that somehow got lost in translation as well. This actually was listed this way as the as built and so the architects had it and, and conveyed that somehow but um somewhere in the process the contractors didn't get the message and and the ir this extra valves and the irrigation aren't benefiting us at this moment and so we may have to change that in the future but um we're working with what we've got here and then the other constraint here is our uh, data logger uh, so this little black dot here is where that's located next to a power and internet source um, right at the, the column for, for the um, PV structure. And one of, one of the challenges there is uh, running soil moisture sensors uh, to each of our plots. We're limited with a 10 meter um, cord. And so these pink boxes, those ones were at the, the extreme limit. Um, we, we had to verify in field even that that was going to be far enough. We, we could, you know, uh, extend it a little bit further with, with some extra soldering and, and so forth. But, uh, but that was really kind of our, our max there. So it worked out reconfiguring our, our layout. We lost the, the plot to the right in that sense, because um, there's no way we could get the, the cords all the way over there with soil moisture sensors. Um, but this is, this is what we ended up settling on. So there's five plots here that are consistently in the shade. Um, so summer and winter, it's, it's going to be mostly shaded on that. Uh, six through 10 here in the middle get good shade in the summer months and then are exposed to the sun in the winter months. And then plots 11 through 15 are in sun both summer and winter. So kind of our control plots. And, uh, and so this is all in the eight inch plot depth. We kind of had to pivot real fast uh, in the field when, when we were trying to Get a sense of where to lay out these plots we started digging holes and that's when we realized 
the irrigation didn't get changed the way we wanted and even the the depths didn't get changed the way we wanted so we had a let go of our, our five inch deep plots for for this study. I, th I think we'll still be able to find ways to engage with that depth, but uh, but for this initial push, these are our 15 plots instead of 20. And here it is laid out. You can see this is from, I think Tuesday is when I took this photo. And you can already start to see the impact that the solar panels have. It's pretty bare out in the full sun and starting to fill out in the, in the shade. Now, <clears throat> as far as um, data goes, you know, I, I mentioned that we've got pushback, pushback. And so I actually don't have a lot of data to show you or conclusions by any means. Um, but I did pull a few numbers and uh, there's a few things that confirm what we're seeing in the, the photo there. Um, this is a count for plant density. So number of plants within a square foot. And uh, you know this, this was targeted on our plots. So in the sun, it's 0.1 plant per square foot. So not a lot going on there. In the mixed for, for kind of shorthand for the summer shade, winter sun, um, there's 2.4 plants per square foot and then 3.6 in the shade. And um, that's an average for our full nine weeks as those plants have come up. I think this is a more interesting uh, look at that. And so this is looking at week to week, uh, how that's changed. So week one is starting in August, on August 24th, all the way up to week nine was yesterday is when our student pulled the data. And, um, and so, you know, the sun has been really low this whole time, uh, even with the monsoon. And uh, the mix seems to have benefited from the monsoon and presumably the shade during that time um, as the, the sun was more directly above. And then as we, we've gotten uh, more into the fall, the angle has exposed it more. There's less uh, rain and the monsoons ended and, and that total number of plants uh, uh, plant density, I should say, has decreased significantly from the beginning. And then the uh, shade mix has been kind of up and down. We do have a, a process of randomization of within the two meter by two meter square plots, we're looking at different quadrants of that each week. And so that does kind of balance a little bit, but generally you can see that stayed well above the, the other two being um, more in that microclimate more consistently. And then measures to come, we haven't got, got too far yet with this. Um, we're going to be looking at coverage. So in that plot, what plants are covering in what ways, what percentages. That relates uh, also to our, our measures of richness and evenness. So how many species are out there and how well distributed are those species? Is there you know, one that dominates and, and others that just show up here and there. Um, and then that relates to uh, our biodiversity calculations. Um, so we've got it set up for Shannon's index for biodiversity. And that's essentially a function of that richness and evenness. So having not only many species, but also having uh, good proportions of each in relation to one another. So we just, um, we actually haven't started um, looking at uh, species just yet. Um, you know, when, when the plant material is young, it's hard to tell what's what. And so we've been looking at mainly just a monocot versus a dicot, uh, more grass-like uh, versus uh, more leaf-like. And, um, and so we, we've got some, some comparisons there. Right now, the monocots are dominating. Uh, it's about 85% monocots in, uh, from our counts. And, um, 
And so, yeah, we'll, we'll continue to observe that. And, and actually about this time, it's finally getting to a point where the plants are getting big enough that we can start to identify them and take those counts. So those, those numbers of, of coverage, even this richness and biodiversity are, are coming soon. Um, the other thing is that, you know, it, it, it's interesting thinking about this project at different scales in the sense that we've got these plots stuck in there, um, but there, it's a full system with edge effect and everything. And so we also want to observe that. And, and then in addition to that, Greg Baron Gafford has some interesting equipment that can measure like photosynthesis and, and a lot of neat stuff too. Um, but then the human aspect to this, this picture on the right, uh, it's hard to tell, but somebody dumped some, some potting soil in there. And, you know, that's kind of an interesting thing, how, how that human influence might, uh, might affect things overall. It's not in one of our plots, but it's fun to make observations like that. You know, we're going to be looking at like pollinators, um, bees and, and well, insects and birds a little more generally. And we, we hope that other professionals will um, kind of join us in, or other researchers will join us in studying that a little deeper. So I'm getting near the end here. I just wanted to kind of switch back to this, this idea of systems integration uh, to mitigate the trade-offs. And so again, we don't have a, a perfect solution here on ENR2 either, but I, th I think uh, a lot of what, what we've seen with the, the design and so forth does justify. So as far as the evapotranspiration, um, you know, eight inches deep, to me feels better for a green roof in Arizona, uh, a little closer to what that monthly ET rate would be. Um, but that's something we can we can study out, see how how that uh, is really interacting. Um, and here, there, there's my depth there. And then as far as plants go, just reducing the plant stress, um, you know, using that evapor uh, evapotranspiration that does happen to help cool the the uh, the panels, and so that water is being used for more than just the green roof in that sense. And so we're we're going to be observing that and make, make sure that's happening. Um, but there's some interesting things to to look for with the water system. So more full systems integration. Thinking about you know there is harvested water. Uh, from the roof here and how does the green roof, is it leaching into that or um, how does that water when irrigating uh, affect the, the plant material and also uh, uh, that's something we'll, we're going to be looking into. As far as the cool roof versus the green roof, um, you know, the justification here is that safety. This middle image shows that drop before the, the green roof went in. Uh, kind of the danger in that sense. And, um, but then, we're, you know, we do have a cool roof to the south, we can compare against those and try to get some, some, some measurements uh, uh, as far as performance goes one compared to the other. And then, uh, you know, I, I, I think it goes without saying next to a, a conference room, having a green roof is a much better experience than having a reflective cool roof right there. So, um, you know, in that sense, it's, it's a good choice. Then as, um, as far as comparing to the ground plane, um, you know, again, that's a hard thing to justify uh, expense wise, but uh, we've got a lot of materials going into this. Um, you know, it'd be interesting to do some comparisons there. Um, but as far as habitat goes, you know, having pollinators up there uh, is, is going to be very valuable. And it uh, creates a diversity of structures well that, that mix that we have. And, um, you know, there's, there's a lot to be studied there and the advantages and disadvantages, the trade-offs there. So that I, I think we're on a good track. But yeah, so there you have it. There's the, the green roof. Um, really, the points I want to drive home is that, you know, we, we can't think about these things in isolation. Um, you know, these systems need to be layered for that maximum benefit. A green roof on its own 
you know, it does have some good aspects, but it can be that much better with uh, a companion system and, uh, you know, layering these things can help us reach uh, a higher performing landscape, even on top of buildings in the Sonoran Desert. So that's what I have for you. Thank you for your attention. And uh, I am happy to take questions. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, I learned a tremendous amount. It, I also was reminded of drawing details of green roofs, what was probably 20, 25 years ago and feeling like this was some crazy cutting edge of like, like how many layers and what are they and how deep and how, yeah, all these questions of structure, the thickness of the soil, we were such newbies. And who knows whether those plants are still alive <laughs> five years later. That so, wasn't in Arizona, was it? No, this was various European countries when I was living and working over there. Uh, yeah, and lots of lots of interest. I'm sure you're familiar with some of the kind of rock star uh, green wall people in Europe. Um, I want to say, um, is it? Patrick Berger, no, he's a glass guy. Or maybe, no, maybe it is Patrick Berger. Um, there are a number of quite iconic green wall installations, uh, both indoors in the, um, at what, what might be referred to as the Anthropological Museum, the what used to be the Musée de l'Homme, the Musée Quai by Jean Nouvel has some interior and exterior uh, vertical green walls um, and a couple of other public public spots. Anyhow, learned a tremendous amount, Kirk. So thank you so much. I'm sure members of the audience have uh, highly intelligent and well-informed questions due to shared expertise. Otherwise I can ask really uninformed or outside the discipline less scientific um, questions. I don't know whether Kelly has um, a question for you or other colleagues who are still here. I don't really have a question, but I just wanted to comment that, you know, I remember when this all was like just barely starting and to see how it's come along and to hear um, how, you know, you've integrated the the PV and now you're studying the plants and it's so exciting and it's so fun. And um, I hope that you'll give another talk like in like next year to tell us what's happened in the next year. Cause I just can't wait to see what happens. But yeah, I don't really have questions, I guess I can think about it, but um, I think it's just really exciting. And I think it's really great work, Kirk. Thanks Kelly. <clears throat> yeah, no worries. Uh, I, I agree. I, you know, like I say, um, I was originally invited for this lecture series last year and, and I was very grateful. I think it got pushed back once and then, it, and then pushed back another time. And, uh, I thought I, I could use it again just to get more data, <laughs> yeah. but, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it, we're, I'm ecstatic finally getting to this point and, and, uh, yeah, it's fun to get even that little bit of data out of here, out of there already. You know, the the patterns we're starting to see. It's it's really kind of fascinating, and I look forward to the full establishment. Well, you're you know certainly for for architects, you're convincing us of a number of things because there's been so much debate back and forth of should we or shouldn't we do a green roof in the desert and and you know, there was one moment was like, yes, 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 we need this everywhere. We need this everywhere for its insulating factor and capturing water. Uh, but you've made a really strong argument about the multiple variables and constraints that need to be considered before going with ahead with such a project. And I thought, you know, particularly the kind of social psychological benefits that justify in some cases where the California example you showed early on um, 
I, I hope birds and bees are profiting because it certainly doesn't look like humans, uh, not to be too anthrocentric uh, in my comment, but it seemed like there was an awful lot of investment um, for not a lot of human benefit from it. So I think also like the architectural cross section, the human access and engagement with these things is, is important in that whole recipe with the technology, water harvesting, biodiversity, all of that kind of stuff. For sure. Yeah, and um, the, I'll, I'll admit uh, kind of the reason I framed it in this way of, of, you know, saying no to green roofs first and then kind of get into the, the layering here is that, you know, I, I was actually hoping for, for more architecture students to be here. I, I love going to architecture reviews and I've been invited to, to quite a few in the, the past few years. And, and you know, they, they come up with very creative, wonderful ideas, but it, it always baffles me a bit when they're trying to put a tree on there with like, you know, no soil. <laughs> There's no no clearance for for the root zone or anything. And and uh, uh, you know, I I actually um, it, it kind of made me think back to when I became a lead AP. I was a student still, and I my, I just kind of naively thought, why isn't every building a lead platinum building? You know, I just couldn't understand it. It made so much sense. And but you get into to practice and learn those realities and and. Uh, and, you know, so I, I thought I'd kind of emphasize that. And there are a lot of trade-offs here that we have to think about. And first and foremost here in Arizona is the water. Um, and so if we can start to, to tackle that, then I, I think a lot of the others come into play. And so in this case, I think it, it is used enough that there is that, that opportunity that people can experience it, uh, whereas others like the, the Penn State law building, that's, that's not the case. But. Are, are you collecting similar kinds of, well, I guess the metrics would obviously have to be somewhat different, but are, is there a good bit of data also being collected in the experiments that are going on in the biosphere where there's is that a, an edible food garden that's growing underneath the, the array up there? Yeah, so um, with that, it's been mostly tomatoes, chiltopine peppers, and uh, jalapenos. And, uh, and, you know, Greg and his team have, have really pushed that. And uh, I, I think they might be expanding to other crops as well, but it, it's got a very strong landing in, in agriculture. Um, I think there's a lot of interest for going large scale with it and so forth. Um, for this, you know, I, I mentioned that on the south side, there was an interest in growing crops up there. And, and that, that was one I, I wasn't as on board with, I, you know, I, I figured if, if they wanted to do it on the south side, that's fine. But Greg was one actually pushing that it didn't happen on, on this north side, thinking in, in terms of the, the um, uh, conference center and the activities that happened there, getting something a little more aesthetic in that sense. And, uh, and then even then, you know, people were wanting to see edibles dispersed out there, but uh, it, it's just, I, I think that relates more to what's happening at the ground level, because in addition to getting soil and everything up on the roof, you're getting crops and, and biomatter down from the roof and, and so forth. It, I mean, I guess you could compost up there to an extent, but it, it's, it's complicated and I don't think we're doing it enough on the ground level. And so let's start with pollinators, uh, you know, good habitat and reach those goals first and then uh, if if that if we can get that to work then we can then explore the the edibles on the roof as well yeah, just my my two cents <laughs> no but i mean it also has to do with how how those the experiments at the biosphere and the experiments that are happening at the enr2 where they begin to be able to be drawn into comparison because you know obviously they're right now they're radically different ones on the ground ones on a roof 
very different plant species, obviously different kinds of conditions. So mm-hmm. yeah, that, that, that could be like future next, next chapter, future. Research. Yeah. Yeah. And there's, there's a, actually a lot of interest from Carrie Ann Campbell um, is, is an alumni of our program uh, with she uh, she's the one that uh, did the seed for us, the seed mix, and and installed it. And she's actually really interested in that on board uh, to to find kind of a, a comparison site on the ground level. And so that's that's something uh, I think we will further explore too. I don't know if it'll be specifically you know the the one out of the biosphere. I think that'll continue as is. But there's there's a lot that we can draw from that too with. Um, Greg's uh, some of his equipment. I, I mentioned the one uh, that measures the the um, photosynthesis, and and he is planning on doing that up here. And and you know, so I think the vegetation, regardless, even though we're not getting like uh, fruit harvests or, or vegetable harvest here, there's there's still a lot of of measurables and positive impacts that can be measured and, and communicated. Do any of our other guests have questions or comments that they want to share? Well, as Kelly pointed out, the one of the wonderful things about the, the difference between landscape architecture and architecture is that things are always, always changing in landscape architecture because of things growing or dying, hopefully not. But um, uh, so yeah, seeing where this goes 12 months from now or after yet another kind of winter, winter rain uh, would be really, really interesting. Yeah, and especially as we get into the summer, uh, you know, during the the most stress for the plants, see, seeing the differences that occur there, um, it'll be really interesting to see. Well, perhaps that is a good place to to wrap it up. Kirk, thank you so very very much with, for sharing your research adventure with us, and wish you all the best and all those plants that they thrive. <laughs> Thank you. And, and thanks to all of you for, for sticking through this. And it was a lot more talking than I'm used to doing and, and would have preferred engaging a little bit more. I, I'm not the biggest fan of the lecture format, but uh, <laughs> I appreciate uh, you guys spending your, your Friday night with me. Thank you.